from the Frontier Regional and Union 38 Special Education Parent Advisory Council, which is known as CPAC. And the letter is dated December 9th, 2020. The Special Education Parent Advisory Council has spoken to families who had difficulty with last week's precautionary closure. We would like to share some of those concerns for this, for this committee to consider as we all move forward. District administrators did not communicate with families or the CPAC about how the temporary closure would impact special education students. Our families know that DESI has urged schools to keep high priority special education students learning in person, regardless of the model that the rest of the district is using. This led, led them to resume, no, to presume that the district would continue to provide in-person learning to high priority students as they had with the phased reopening in September. The logistics of this transition were especially complicated for our families. Disabled students require special supervision and support that is difficult to get in place on short notice. <clears throat> in the midst of securing childcare, families also have to coordinate schedules with the many teachers and providers who meet with their child on a daily basis. Caregivers and teachers pieced together schedules as best they could, but many students did not get the full amount of IEP services. For those who did get services set up, the remote format was widely ineffective. The CPAC has highlighted the issues with remote learning for this population at previous school committee meetings. DESI has also acknowledged that these issues as I also acknowledge these issues and put out specific guidance to ensure disabled students are being treated equitably by having as much in-person learning as possible. Beyond the educational impact, we want to share with you the emotional toll on families. Disabled students rely on consistency and the sudden shift left nearly all of them struggling emotionally and behaviorally. This undue stress impacts both students and their families for weeks. In a normal year, special education families barely survive a week-long break from school after being without support all spring and summer. This extra week was unbearable. Parents' frustration grew even deeper as they learned that many teachers were working in the buildings. Their children were home, were home having anxiety, behavioral issues, unable to access their education, because they were told it was unsafe to be in the buildings, yet teachers were on site. The optics of this so further distrust among special ed families. The CPAC board has been in communication with Darius regarding these concerns. We are hopeful that the district will resolve these issues prior to any future precautionary closures. We thank you all for your time and continued collaboration. And then um, it's from uh, um, it's from CPAC, Holly Chair, Holly Johnson, co-chair, Asia Cerrone, co-chair, Harry Thurlow, secretary, and Crystal Brown, treasurer. Okay, so, um, Jen, would you like to share your comments with us? Hi, everybody. Um, I actually had something prepared that I was going to um, read today, but with our this interesting turn of events, I'm going to actually say something different. So um, I just wanted to thank you all for making this decision um, to close or to go remote, I should say. Um, I know that these decisions are not easy um, and there are different opinions out there, but you have a lot of relieved teachers right now. Um, and I know that you'll continue to, to watch the numbers closely and um, do your best to do what's right for, for all of us. So I appreciate all of your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Okay. So now we are going on to unfinished business. 
and some of these um, concerns we'll talk about in the COVID-19 update. But I see that Jameson is here and I assume Jameson is giving the update on the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee. If you're ready for that, Jameson. Is, is he frozen? Mm -hmm. He's frozen or very still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he left the meeting. I think he has, uh, he's had connection issues in the past. Um, we can wait a minute or, or we can go on to the COVID-19 update. What do you think, Darius? Well, why don't we wait a minute? Yeah, I mean, either way, I can start talking about it. We can break away. It's not... <clears throat> such tricky stuff that you won't be able to break thought. <laughs> um, so I guess I can give an update on COVID. I mean, obviously it's hot off the press. Um, basically what what, what happened um, last night into today, um, we received last night the um, countywide um, infection rate, uh, no, positivity rate, sorry, um, was, was over 3%. And that's another one of our metrics where Franklin County is 3%, <clears throat> state 5%, 50 cases or more in Franklin County, <clears throat> and you know, generally looking at overall spread. And so um, when we broke that um, metric, um, it kind of was the, uh, the sweet spot where all our metrics were broken. Um, and our other metric of 50 is now going to be around 210. We imagine tomorrow's numbers, you're going to see um, two-week two -week totals over 200. Um, when our two-week total breaker was 50. Um, we're seeing the number of cases each day. Yesterday, we had uh, the case total in Franklin County of 42. Um, while the town of, you know, being the Waitley meeting, um, the town of Waitley's numbers are around, I believe they have around five active cases. We'll see what the, the state spits out for a number tomorrow. Um, tonight, going to come out tonight, late tonight. Um, Waitley itself is kind of low, but the neighboring community, um, Deerfield's going to probably be around 20 something um, due to a major outbreak there. Um, and Sunderland's going to be around a dozen still. Um, they're kind of stable, but stable at a number. And Conway is now on the board with um, probably four to six um, cases coming out this week. So I'll pause there on those numbers because um, um, Jameson is back. Jameson, you there? We said we'd, we'd start, we'd start, I started talking about COVID stuff, which we can go on all night about. So I'd be happy to hand it over to you for our anti-racism work. All right, I think I'm here. Uh, no, not yet. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, you'd think since I'm on this thing all day that it would be, easier to connect and figure out when you're talking and when you're not. All right, so um, updates from the committee for December. Uh, the PD subcommittee reports that the high school had their fourth workshop with Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass yesterday on the 9th, and the last two workshops focused on social identity and personal identity. Um, elementary professional development reports that have concluded for the first semester and will resume in the second semester, focusing on classroom implementation of the plans they made here in the fall. From the curriculum subcommittee, eighth grade is continuing with the stamped curriculum. There has been some pushback, but overall it's going well. Elementary has created a glossary of terms to be used at all elementary schools that will be distributed soon. Five books per elementary grade level have been chosen and will be worked into the PD for second semester. From school culture, um, FRCOG Communities That Care Advancing Anti-Racism in Schools Timeline Update. There will be a January assessment of what is already in place and being done, and in February and March, student focus groups will be on, student focus groups for on-the-ground feedback. Hmm. Logo voting will begin shortly. The committee is discussing how we might support teams with fundraising for new gear, particularly teams who have the old feather logo for the Dream Campaign. And from the school uh, policy committee, 
Uh, we are working on recommendations for revisions to student handbooks and looking for student input on some sections on the handbook. And we are planning to send out a staff survey to check for understanding about uh, discipline procedures for incidents of hate speech. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Anyone have any questions for Jameson or comments? Sounds like good work. It, you know, it's coming along. It is a, it's a big lift. So, you know, that's it. And we appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of moving parts. I was gonna say, Chrissy, can you add? Is there anything special about what's happening at Waitley that you could add in there as well? Just to well, I was just gonna say that um, I sat in on a lot of the sessions that were happening. Um, the, all of the teachers were and uh, instructional assistants were broken into different um, working groups, and they had um, different resources to read or videos to watch. And then there was discussion, and the discussion was just kind of amazing. You know, it was it was amazing to see people sort of lower their guard and be really honest about where they're at in terms of their own personal understanding of um, the current state of affairs and, and themselves. Um, so that part has been really great. Um, we've always had a team here very um, invested in making sure that our students um, understand what exists outside of Waitley. Because um, if you live in Waitley, you can have the wrong idea of what the world really looks like. Um, and so the same group of folks who um, have been leading this group of kids called the Global Leaders will um, work to begin the process of looking through um, initially our library and our classroom libraries just to see what kind of shifts we can make in that area toward um, representing um, Black and Indigenous people of color and really just um, a view of, of the world that's different than what we, we currently have. So that's sort of the beginning of our work here. And I also wanna thank Jameson and Amanda and everyone else who has kind of pulled this together. It's not easy. I, I know from trying to plan professional development in the past that it is not easy. You guys make it look easy and effortless, but you've created an environment that has allowed people to feel safe to say, what they want to say um, and to ask the questions that need to be asked. So um, my hat is off to you because I, I know that in other places this work A doesn't happen and B doesn't happen with the kind of openness and honesty that that I've seen here. So thank you so much. I'm not going to take any credit for that. That's all I'm going to Um. Did Amanda? Did you wanna have any say anything, or are you just listening? You're muted right now. Um, I'm happy to kind of provide my perspective um, on the sort of close of this this first kind of term of professional development, and also um, looking ahead to the spring and what that will bring with it. Um, it's been the best thing that's happened to me in 2020 <laughs> to be back working in this district doing anti-racist professional development, curriculum development. It's been a lot of fun and a thrill that I did not expect. <laughs> I'm not going to lie when I um, when COVID forced me back here. Um, but I think from my perspective and from the feedback that I've received, and I sent out a really comprehensive kind of exit survey that I've only just started looking at. Um, but from what I can see, the impact has been incredible, I think. It's overwhelmingly positive, the feedback that I received. I think the the biggest uh, kind of critiques or adjustments that teachers said, and this is completely understandable, was 
So a lot of people actually asked for more PD time, <laughs> even more, <laughs> which there was already a lot. Um, there were eight weeks given for small group work. Um, and so people were asking for more PD time on top of that. Um, and some recommended that things be spread out rather than weekly there would be kind of more spread um, because with everything that's going on, a lot of teachers said that they were tired and they felt like they couldn't bring their full selves to their groups, um, which is completely understandable. Um, and the other kind of biggest thing, aside from time and allocation, was uh thinking about how do we implement this in the classroom what does this look like you've kind of opened our eyes to all of these different <laughs> these different injustices that are occurring and now what now what what do i do with all this information um and so that's really what i've been thinking about when starting to plan the professional development for the spring semester with um, Romina uh, Pacheco, Sapphire Dijon, um, and myself, we're gonna be uh, creating the kind of professional development curriculum um, with the help of the professional development committee of teachers. Um, and we've met, twice so this is still very much uh, a loose framework and i can give no specifics really quite yet um but the sort of pillars that we are really kind of trying to use to anchor the the next term are kind of critical thinking and discernment so that'll be you know, auditing curriculum, adjusting curriculum, and developing curriculum um, and lesson plans that are more diverse, more honest, um, better representative, not just of, you know, trauma and pain, but also, for example, joy and resistance um, and pedagogy. So how to implement this, these changes with care, not just for, you know, the few students of color that might be in the class, but also if you're talking about, you know, honest history, that's really ugly and really painful and really scary and really upsetting for anyone to hear. Um, and so to really take care of all of the students who are who are kind of learning this. Um, and and uh, this this plan is also changing, but um, I am sort of thinking that uh, teachers will go into either like English language arts or social studies and kind of branch off sep separately and then create and develop lesson plans, analyze those different lesson plans in those same small group setting that we had this past, um, this past term and then implementing those in the classroom and then returning to the small groups you know, the next week or two weeks later, um, receiving feedback, uh, updating their group on how things went. That's sort of what I'm thinking. And again, this is subject to lots of change, um, but that's what I'm thinking for the professional development for this, this coming semester, essentially in small groups so that with that kind of safety net and support system teachers start to implement what they learned this past this past um semester of professional development yes thank you amanda i love your enthusiasm <laughs>
<laughs> I'm happy I to. Can, I can see how happy you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to uh, take any questions about that as as well, or what I've what I've said. Any questions? I don't have any questions, but I don't either. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jameson. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye, Thanks Amanda. Hard work. <laughs>
not to see if you have COVID. So it has a very poor rate of tracking COVID unless you have symptoms. So the idea is if someone was symptomatic at school, adult or child, you could give them this test and they would be able to the test would be able to determine that your body's creating antigens, uh, antibodies in battling a virus, a COVID. <laughs> anybody who gets the test will then have to follow up with a PCR test um, to, to confirm that they have, even if you have a test positive, you have to confirm that it is COVID where a PCR test actually tests for the COVID virus. If that kind of makes sense. Um, so the idea is that it doesn't, it's, we don't want people sending their children to school to get tested. If the child has symptoms, we're going to ask them to go get a PCR test anyway. So you shouldn't expose risk to your community, your school community, by sending a child in. Um, but will it, will, what it does do is it allows us to be, be more, react more quickly. Instead of someone going home sick, they then have to get an appointment. They then get a test. If it, and depending on test times, we've seen the range from 24 to 48, and sometimes even longer than that, depending on um, you know the testing site and you know, what the amount of action that testing state is having. So it allows us to know immediately, like, wow, we, we possibly have a case here. We're going to have to um, either quarantine your room or, or begin to, um, you know, take actions um, thereabouts. So that, that's the idea there, and that, that can be very helpful from a school standpoint. It's not, you know, um, for the patient itself, it only means they're going into it. They're going to have to go get a test. If it's negative, they still have to get a test because your body, you could have COVID, your body hasn't created enough antibodies yet in response to COVID. You know, everybody does it at different rates, even within the same family and that kind of thing. And so some people, you know, it's the same thing of having minor symptoms to extreme symptoms to COVID. Um, it's about how your body's um, attacking that, um, that virus. So, any, so that's kind of the overview there. We did some, we did send some clarifying language out there. Um, and then also now that we're closed, uh, we're, you know, remote for the next week and a half. Um, you know, I, I did talk at the last school committee meeting that um, we probably were, that state's rollout was slower than, they said we got it, we'd be sending it, but then they did, they waited a week to do a training and then they waited a week to send, send it out. So it's been kind of a, a slower rollout than we did. Um, it is the state's thing that this is phase one of multiple phases, so there'll be more testing and that kind of thing. However, I think, because um, I think testing is going to be needed around for a while because even after vaccinations for teachers has now been rolled out by the state, to occur in February, um, February, um, March is the um, kind of window they said they're in phase, teachers will be considered phase two, which is very positive news that I, if everything goes as planned, which we can never account on, but I think we can go with some positive news um, mm -hmm. given every, how things are going, that we may have a fourth quarter that has some, some, some level of normalcy in it. Um, what it means we'll still be identifying because they're talking about whether or not we still have to have masks you know, it may be still good to even have antigen testing at that point if someone is sick to remove them to the community um, because I don't believe that there will be no child vaccination at that point. But um, I think our major concern has been adults who are um, adults getting the virus um, because of, um, you know, adverse effects of the virus and such. So, All right. I think that's my, I mean, the other stuff that COVID, you know, any questions regarding today's decision and such, um, it, it's complicated. Um, it's more complicated than, I'm not sure if it's more than it has to be. That's probably the wrong term. We have a lot of people that are involved because we're running four communities, five schools, um, school boards, boards of health, and trying to work together. So, you know, I literally probably had, I didn't call every school community member, I called chairs, but, um, you know, between that and all the, in the board of health members I called, I mean, dozens of calls back and forth, getting everybody's thoughts and opinions on it. And, um, you know, I do also know there's a whole, I just like I said to Bob as I got into this meeting, I mean, had a media call from a parent who was very upset. Um, you know, thinks that schools are, you know, believes that schools are safe and that their child needs to be there, and it's very upsetting. So it's a, it's a we're in a no-win situation, and you can see I'm kind of tired from the day, um, and I feel for both, 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 both. I don't want to say sides. I know that's how it comes out, but you know, both the, the families that need to have their kids in school and the kids that need to be in school, and then the concerns of both. You know infections and those who don't do well with the infection. So, um, yeah, I think we all know the, we know the, we know the game rules, I guess. So anyway, enough for me. Okay. Darius, um, where, um, where does the percentage need to be in Franklin County in order for the kids to go back to school on January 4th? 
That's a good question. So I talked with both um, with with union leaders of both unions, and we're going to discuss because what I said is what I don't want to do is create metrics that are unattainable. If the if the um, I think the real thing that we're going to look at is does it, does it level off and is it going down? Um, you know, and um, can we can we look at re look at those metrics? Because I think the metrics one could even say the metrics right now are dated, but it's what we agreed on you know, that we'd be looking at them. And, you know, the first couple of things when the, the metrics were hit, we said, you know, this is yes, but yes, but um, today's, you know, the, as the information from yesterday, the yes, but I didn't think fit as well anymore because when you're talking about not only are metrics broken, but all of them are broken and it con con are continued to rise. So it's not just, oh, if we had 51 cases and we barely broke that metric, well, maybe we'd have to have another conversation and do the consult with the Board of Health to say, you know, the metrics are here, but we're seeing, we're seeing community spread. And that's what we've been talking about from the beginning that, you know, when we were talking about in October, we had a meeting near the end of October, early November, we had our first cases and everybody's like, you know, there was a scare and what are we doing? And we, we as leaders were saying, yeah, but there's no community spread. It's that kind of thing, but now there's community spread. So I think we need to look at, um, you know, how, what is that going to look like for the next stage? Because I think we built this to get up to where we are now. And I think we have to look at it and, and adjust it and work with our teachers to um, find what we consider safe you know, parameters. And what I did say is that in-person is important. I think the, in the unions, people I spoke with agreed to that, um, but we have to make sure it's safe. So, um, so it's not gonna be a clear answer if there's a lot of politician talk there. Um, I mean, if it's under 3%, then I think we're automatically going to be back without a problem. If it's still at 3% or whatever, I'm going to be meeting with the union of people to say, is it still growing? Let's look at the numbers and um, and that kind of thing. So, um, and then, you know, overall cases and such. I mean, if we're, in a, if we're in a worse place in January because we get another hiccup after the other set of holidays coming, um, you know, maybe it's still going to be unsafe for schools. I mean, that's a realistic thing that can happen. And I know... Nobody wants to hear that. I want to just stay paint everything positive. I've done that for a long time, but I also want to be realistic. If it's if it's still ugly out there, or gotten worse, then you know we're going to have to um, be talking about that problem with those facts. So that's where we're at. So and so we're having that meeting the twenty eighth. So parents will have a heads up. It won't just be the night before. Um, the only way it would be the night before is if something you know off snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> there is supposed to be snow next week, so technically we probably would have had a remote day or two next week anyways. <laughs> Did you say, um, were you talking about the Board of Health meeting on the 28th? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They'd said it was the 29th. Did it change? Thank you for correcting me. 29th? At 5. Yeah, I don't have my... Uh, I don't have That's my all calendar. right. I, I just, just want everyone to know so they're not looking for it on yeah, the 20th. Look for the posting and... Um, I'm sure okay. it'll be a call. Does anyone have any other questions about the COVID update? Well, later on tonight, we, Darius and I and uh, Frontier have a meeting with the select board and, and um, Board of Health from Deerfield and talking about winter sports and it's, you know, we, we've already had some pushback from the hockey community and they play in a co-op out of Greenfield. And, you know, it, it's there again, it's other tough decisions that for the safety of the kids and the parents and the coaches. So that, that, that meeting starts, that's a zoom meeting. It starts, correct me if I'm wrong. It's seven o'clock Darius. Six, six o'clock. Okay. Um, if yeah, you need it's a tough, to tough week. I mean, we scheduled it from last week. We scheduled this week, and last week the numbers weren't as bad as obviously this week. So um, it'll be, you know, it'll be a good conversation and see, and we'll see if there's enough information to make a decision too. I think that's what I've been hearing as well. But um, for those of you connected to that world, because people are important stuff, so you know, to those families as well. Okay, so now we're on to new business, the fiscal year 22 budget discussion. Yeah, so to be honest, we, where did Shelly go? I'm you here. Picked the fine time to leave me. 
<laughs> oh, there she is. Oh, you moved. <laughs> so, you know, Chrissy, I guess I say Chrissy, because in our admit meeting, someone's always like, they always put in an alphabetic order. It's not an alphabetic order on my screen. No. Mine's not either. It's not on mine either. I, Elaine must have sprinkled some kind of fairy dust on her. When we get on, Elaine, Mount, the assistant principal's like, well, don't you guys understand? It's, 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 it's done um, alphabetically on your screen. And so I don't know if it's a setting or something, but. I think on mine, it goes in order of who got on the meeting. Well, like, well, whoever if you're late, it's up, you'll you'll know, right? you know the whole meeting. All right, yes, Shelly's going to, Shelly will give you the overview. Shelly, I've talked to mine. <laughs> So we've started the budgeting process. Um, we are a little bit behind. Normally we would be probably giving you a draft to look at at this meeting or at least discussing in greater detail than we're gonna do today. Um, but Christy and I have had uh, a little bit of dialogue around this, primarily just to see if there's any major staffing changes that are gonna pop up that we need to request additional funds for. Um, but we are anticipating starting the draft with a level service budget, meaning existing programs, existing staff stay in place. Um, we consider COLA increases and step increases based on contracts. And then um, <clears throat> it's really a cost of living adjustment primarily for non-union staff. So that's sort of our starting point. Um, I have had a conversation with Brian Domino, the town administrator, and uh, he said that, you know, they're not really in a rush at this point to get the budget process moving because there's no numbers from the state for them, even from 21, never mind 22. Um, and I think he actually just sent an email later this afternoon before we were getting on this meeting saying that the select board did vote to push back the annual town meeting until May or June. So their budget timeline is going to be different than a typical year as well. Um, so we'll be ahead of the game, hopefully, but, it, you know, it could be a lot like last year where things are moving target and we don't really know exactly what the picture looks like until much farther into the spring. Okay. I know you're expecting more, but when I make the agenda, it's weeks in advance, and so I didn't know where we would be. <laughs> Because they normally start talking about budget this time of year, so I just start putting those things on. So you're kind of like, oh my God, there is this. You put this on the agenda, that wasn't a whole lot, but um, you know, we're still. And we did uh, submit capital requests. I should have mentioned that too. We submitted. You you sent those yeah. in. Right, the two capital requests went in this week or late last week for Waitley for the elementary school, and then Frontier will have a request to the towns as well. Yep, yeah, that was for the oven and for the floors, right? Yeah, thank you for that. Do you think in January we'll have um, a draft or it's too still too early to tell? Well, we'll have a draft for sure, but it's really, you know, hypothetical until we know what numbers look like. Um, particularly for us, it's Chapter 70 and determining how much um, less this, the town is going to get, if anything, mm -hmm. and whether or not they can um, offset that that loss if there is a loss, but I'll definitely have a draft. So we'll at least have a rough idea of what, you know, level um, service looks like for us. Okay, so now we're up to the school improvement plan. Chrissy, do you want to take that? Yep, and, um, you know, not to disappoint again, on top of not much budget information, um, and I think I, did you all receive the school improvement plan? I shared it with you this afternoon. I received it, but I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. Do you remember last year's? Well, it looks very similar to last year. Um, because we were quite interrupted this year and our attention turned to um, really getting good at remote learning, which I have to say, I'm so amazed at what people have accomplished. You know, it, it came to my mind today as we were preparing because I was brought back to March 13th when we were in the, you know, the same situation sort of um, and how different it was on March 13th to think about kids being remote learning. Like all of a sudden it was, that was crazy. So at least I feel like we've got a lot of good things in place. I've seen some amazing things happening. So anyway, um, had I known that we were going to have a pandemic, I would have made a goal for that last year. Um, but the goals are staying the same. There are a few activities within the goals that are going to change your action steps, um, mainly to reflect the anti-racism work that we're doing. Um, 
So the first goal is that educators at Waitley Elementary School will continue to cultivate a culture of equity, excellence, and high student achievement. Goal two, educators at Waitley Elementary School will plan for and deliver instruction that is differentiated to meet the needs of all learners. Goal three, 85% of students will demonstrate one year's growth or more in writing in the categories of organization, elaboration, and craft based on the Lucy Calkins learning progression. Um, and really the, the bigger piece for me there is the second part of the goal is 100% of the students will demonstrate growth. And that's really what we need to look at this year. Um, you know, when we talk about one year's growth, when However, much of the year was taken up with um, non-traditional learning. We have to look at things a little bit differently, but um, we're really going to be focusing on um, growth from whatever point anyone started at this year. Um, goal four, students at Waitley Elementary School will receive instruction in the tools and strategies that foster social and emotional well-being. And really, given our circumstances right now, I feel like one of the changes I should have made is to put that as goal number one. Um, social and emotional well-being is kind of king right now. Um, the, the name of the game has been to keep everyone feeling okay and safe, and it's, it's really tricky to do. You know, the, the staff has done a really great job, and this is part of my report later, but they've really, really worked so hard to implement all of the stuff. It's not, it's not natural. It's not second nature. It doesn't you know, it hasn't become habit. And so it's constantly thinking about, is everyone as safe as they possibly can be? Have we sanitized our hands before this activity and after this activity? And, um, you know, th there's just a lot going on. And amidst all that, it's really important for us to pay attention to how kids and adults are um, feeling emotionally. We don't want to let something fall through the cracks just because our time in person is interrupted. Um, and, and Teachers have been able to come to me, come to Dr. Birch to have discussions when they notice that, that a child either on a remote session or in person seems to be struggling with something. So we're really just trying to stay on top of that right now. Um, when the world writes itself, there's going to be a whole different set of um, social and emotional lessons that we're going to need to undertake. Um, you know, one of the concerns is that kids are developing a, a fear of closeness, a fear of not having masks on. So I think we're going to face those things once the, the world becomes normal again. So that really is, in my mind, um, right under physical health and safety, the social and emotional well-being really need our attention. Um, as I said, there's action steps that are mainly the same as last year with a few additions, um, but it's, it's work that needs to continue. Okay. We normally vote on this, I think, right? So maybe we can put that on the agenda for next month to vote on it. Can we vote on it this month? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't um, worry. You can you can wait a month if you want a time to review it and you have comments and such. But if you think you're going to approve it, I would just move it along. We usually do it in the same month. Um, I mean, it's not, I know, as Chrissy said, it's kind of a continuation of some of the other activities. So. Um, it's up to you, but I'm just saying it's not a policy. It's not a rule that we have to hold one month and vote the other. Well, it's not going to hold anything up, is it, if we wait a month? So I, li I like to read things. Let's wait until next month. Um, now we're at reports. I do not have a report as the chair. And the collaborative, we had a meeting, but... Um, it was a lot of um, voting on to approve the, the audit and the financials and the budget and the annual report and things like that. So that's all I have. Oh, Chrissy, I had it, well, you might be talking about this in the principal's report if you had anything else to add, but did you get any response to that um, long-term sub, IA sub posting? That is something that I was going to add. I okay. um, I got some responses, but this, I also, <clears throat> this person was referred to me by another staff member. Um, 
and I don't want to announce a name yet because the, he's still in the paperwork process of it, but um, I have made the offer and he has accepted it and um, I'm, I'm thrilled. I think he's going to be a really great fit and really help us out at a time when um, things are going to, things are going to be tricky. Um, okay. That's good. Cause yeah. I know you had posted it and hadn't gotten any responses. So yeah. And I was, I was starting to sweat it cause it really, there's a whole lot that rides on making sure I've got the uh, enough staff in each classroom to, to make this work. Um, and am I up next for the principal's report? Yes. Yes. Okay. You might as well go ahead. Um, so this relates to what I'm about to say. Um, at our last meeting, as you know, I presented our plan for moving into phase three of reopening before I had a chance to send a family update that Sunday night. Um, with information about increasing the four days, we had a setback. Um, the, that positive case within the school made it seem like not such a great idea to move forward with mm -hmm. phase three. So the new timeline on phase three, um, assuming that we're in good shape, um, would be that on Monday, January 11th, so one week, one week after the return to school, um, kindergarten and first grade students would begin four days of in-person learning per week, um, attending on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. The following week, G January 19th, which is a Tuesday because the Monday is a holiday, um, grades two through six will begin four days of in-person learning per week, also Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, and it was really important for us to have that new staff member in order to make a four-day program work. Um, I am, I'm much relieved to have that because the, the other option was that I was going to be the, the other, the other IA, which, which would be fine too, but th there's a lot going on here. Um, so the plan originally was that K and one, we're going to return four days beginning three days ago. And because we put that on hold, they really put off quite a quite a while. But grades two through six were originally going to come back on the 11th, so it's really just a one week delay from when they were coming four days. So um, I put that one in the in the win column. Um, I've had mixed feelings all along about, you know, am I am I doing this too slowly? Um, should we be moving to four days sooner? And you know, no one has a crystal ball. But in hindsight, based on the things that have happened, I feel pretty good about the fact that we've been, you know, sort of taking our time getting to, to four days and not rushing into anything before we're properly staffed or when the numbers are not in the right direction. So although I probably frustrated Darius, um, somehow or other, we all ended up on the same timeline. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's tough being the black sheep of the family, but I, I'm OK with it. Um, I know today it was, an, it was a difficult decision to make, and I know that um, Darius would take flack on it no matter which way the, the, the dice rolled, um, much like he does on a snow day. So this is like a snow day times, times a thousand. But um, as, as much as my heart goes out to the, the families who are going to struggle with child care, um, the stress that I was seeing on my staff members was concerning. You know, and any one of them or all of them had the ability to call in sick or get a doctor's note to stay home for a while. And nobody did because they all wanted to be here as long as kids were in the building um, and they're putting themselves at risk. There are a wide variety of comfort levels in terms of this virus. And that's true anywhere. Um, and. You know, and I'm I'm pleased that this decision was made, and and I I'm shocked to hear myself say that because I the idea of kids not being in school drives me a little bit nuts, um, but putting people at risk, it's it just not not okay to do right now or or really ever. So I appreciate um, all of the work that went into that because I think Darius had to talk to um, probably the entire town of Waitley since it's such a small town, but so many different parties that are involved in this when you got so many towns involved. Um, so I I appreciate that. And I am hopeful that things will um, somehow start going in the right direction so that this plan for phase three can go through. Um, it'll be great to have kids back four days a week. I, I have been concerned about everyone being remote since the beginning, but I particularly am concerned about our 
our littlest learners who um, can't access learning uh, remotely as well as some of the older kids. Um, <clears throat> so what else? I had something here about the, uh, the, the staff has completed the first phase of professional development about anti-racism, but the rest of it has already kind of been um, shared. Um, <clears throat> just that I've gotten only positive feedback from staff members who've enjoyed the rich discussions that have come from the prof professional development sessions. Um, let's see, at the end of the calendar year, the district um, food service director will be leaving us. And I just wanted to thank Mary DeLusa for her service. Um, she's leaving big shoes to fill and um, I wish her well in her new location. Um, happy for her that she's gonna get to be near family, so. Uh, that's it for me. Chrissy, I have one question. Um, yep. Actually, a two-part question. Um, you know, teachers were really um, feeling nervous and anxious to go back to the building after Thanksgiving break. I'm just wondering, you know, how they're feeling about the phase three reopening and <clears throat> what the school is doing to kind of prepare for all grades to be in school together. So... Now that we kind of have the timeline, uh, there are some logistical things that have to be worked out, like recess is going to have to be a little different, lunch is going to have to be a little different, arrival and dismissal are going to have to be a little bit different, but we are fortunate to be a small school. Um, even when we're all here, it's still going to be a very manageable number. Um, I think, especially given the way the decision was made today, I think people trust that we are looking out for everyone's well-being, um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that alleviates some of the, the stress that people feel about what's going on. Um, you, you know, I, I think I've seen it done so well. The kids do a, remar a remarkable job of wearing those masks. As they need their reminders, put it back up over your nose, and um, but for the most part, they're being good sports about it. You know, it's not fun. No one loves to wear the mask, but they're doing it. Um, and I think they've had a, you know, a good long time now to practice all these protocols and it has become a bit of second nature for them. So I, I think adding that other half the school and it really is the difference of, I think like on, on some days we're adding an additional 40 days on the other day, it's an additional 50, 50 kids. Um, and so it's not a, it's not a huge onslaught of people who are going to be walking in this, this building on that on that day. Um, and I think the staff knows I'm always open to feedback. If anyone has any concern of any kind, I am right there ready to figure out what the solution is. And that's the other thing is there, there's problem after problem, which is to be expected in a situation like this. We're all doing this for the first time. And every time something has come up, I've had a team of people here who've been ready to problem solve and pitch in. And we have just, we've figured things out that, that I was concerned we would not be able to figure out. So it's the, the teamwork that I think is going to get us through this. And if at any time I think that um, any practice we put in place, bringing everyone back four days is putting anyone at risk, then we will dig in and figure out how to fix it. Chrissy, I got some. Is part B? Oh. Did I answer the part B of your question? Yes, thank you so much. I also wanted to say, you know, I did feel that anxiety. I, I did get some emails from teachers, but I, I really want to thank the staff because the, the kids don't feel that at all. They don't get that from the teachers. They don't come home nervous. So that's just like a huge compliment to all of you guys because we really appreciate that as parents. I agree 100% with what Chris said. Yeah. I got I got one positive thing. I, I don't remember the Saturday, but Santa Claus is coming to Waitley. And I think uh, the fire truck. So if, if we haven't sent out an email, um, I only saw it on Facebook. So if we could send an email out, there's a particular route that they take. It's their third annual yeah. one. So it's great. If I'm not mistaken, it went out this afternoon. Um, Jim Savini sent it to me, and I sent it on to Mary Lisensky, who I'm sure it probably was out in the next five minutes. So I don't know if you guys have gotten it yet, but it'll be coming to your email. And I was actually going to include that in my report because I feel like I, I needed some like good happy news. Um, 
because usually we have lots of things to add to the principal's report about, you know, different activities the kids are involved in or field trips or that. And I feel like my reports have been sorely lacking in the sort of the human side of things since all this started. So I was going to put Santa on there, but I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. But thank you for bringing that up, Bob. Hey, we're never too old for Santa. <laughs> um, is this meeting being live streamed, Darius? Some, somebody contacted me and the, um, couldn't, when, but they might be I, trying to get on the meeting. Remember when I disappeared for a minute? I'm sorry. You're, you're, I don't know if it's my computer, but you're. I, I didn't catch that. I'll try again. Remember when I disappeared for a moment? I had to reset the system. So if they were exactly there, at four, I think the live stream oh. started like at four oh two or something. But I see it. I have it open on another screen. I'm watching us. We're there. Uh, Nine people are watching. Um, we gotta do more. We gotta do more for ratings. Oh, somebody else. Somebody else just told me that they are seeing the meeting. So I'm not sure. And she sent. She sent it at four thirty, and I just saw the one who can't see it. Um. I have, the link open. Well, I, I have the link open and I'm watching it, so. Um. Okay. Um, I think, uh, where, where do you, Darius? I don't know if you had anything more to add to your superintendent's report. Okay. No. Are we going into executive session today? Okay. No. Then, uh, um, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Does Madam anybody Chairman. else have anything? No. Okay. Beth, second. Uh, yes. Beth, second. Oh. Okay. All in favor, Bob? Yes. Beth. And Maureen, yes. yes.